We have just sung of the precious Bible. Now, I sometimes wonder how precious it really is to us. I'm not uh, being critical nor pessimistic, but I think that uh, there may be a tendency on the part of all of us to take the Bible for granted. In the first place, I guess you're aware that the word Bible is not in the text of the book. But Bible, I guess, means the book, and that's what it is. But it is the Word of God, and that is in the Bible numerous times. But to appreciate the preciousness of the Bible to us, we need to appreciate, first of all, that though they would like to have it and may have heard of it a few times, many people in the world have never seen a Bible. When I say many, that's quite comprehensive. I suspect that out of the five million people living on the earth today, five billion people, uh, I suspect that uh, there may be two billion who have never seen a Bible. This is true because of the circumstances in China and India and some other places. And the hunger that they have, as was expressed in our prayer a moment ago, something about that, the hunger that they have for something that they don't know about, but they have a conscience and they realize there is something more than that which they have. And then the few who have heard of the Bible are so eager for it that I suppose we could accommodatively say they would give their left arm to have a Bible. They will indeed, we're seeing the reports that they will indeed risk their whole life in order to have a Bible, though it would be against the law of their land uh, to have it. So we need to appreciate this morning as we approach the last lesson in this series on evangelism as far as I am concerned, we need to realize that the world is lost without the gospel. When I went to Africa, this was a problem to some of my friends because some of them felt that those people who, have, who do not have the Bible and who do not know of God are safe anyway. But the Bible teaches us that sin is a transgression of the law. And Isaiah said in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sin has hid his face from you. Hid, yes, uh, his face from us is what he said. The point is that these people have transgressed God's law. They have violated the moral principles that are eternal in their nature the moral principles that were right before there ever was a written Word of God and will be right if the time should ever come that the written Word would be destroyed. These principles pertain to our conscience and the most uh, ignorant and unlearned and degraded heathen in the world has a realization that murder is wrong. And actually, most of them, that fornication and adultery is wrong, and lying and stealing. It seems to be an inborn uh, quality that God has given to all humanity. And therefore, they have a yearning for something to alleviate that situation, to relieve them of that. And therefore, because of this, because they have violated their conscience and because they have violated the principles, the dynamic undergirding foundation principles of society and of human life, 
I believe they're guilty of sin and that God counts them as guilty and that they are lost in that condition. In Romans chapter 10, beginning at the 13th verse, the Apostle Paul said, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I'm not going to discuss what it means to call on the name of the Lord, for I'm sure this intelligent audience understands that it means more than saying, Lord, Lord. For Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father which is in heaven. And so for those people to cry out, Lord, Lord, even if they could in sincerity do that, it would not bring them forgiveness of their sins. And uh, so the rest of that passage, after, uh, if we begin in verse 13 of Romans chapter 10, he said in the 14th verse, How shall they call on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they, how, how, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? And that's where we come into the picture. And how shall they preach except they be sent? And that's part of what we're going to be dealing with this morning. And so in verse 17 he said, Now faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And that brings us back to our starting point regarding the Bible. If these people in the world who do not know there is a Jehovah God and who do not know there is a Bible and specifically do not know that there is a New Testament uh, that contains the gospel of salvation, if these people are indeed guilty of sin and if God charges them with that sin, then we can truthfully say that the world is lost uh, without the gospel. And even our neighbors in this sophisticated land, even our neighbors who know there is a Bible and who have maybe several copies of the Bible in their house and who uh, are practicing some kind of religion that they think is based upon the Bible, even they are lost if they have not known the truth that can make them free, and if they have not known that gospel, which is the power of God to salvation. If they, in other words, if they have known and understood a perverted gospel, then that perverted gospel will not bring them to salvation. It is a reality that we don't like to face. When we see our neighbors who are good people, sincere, conscientious, religious, devout uh, people, maybe better people than we are or as good and better than many members of the Lord's church, and yet we have to face the reality without the gospel, without the real word of God, they are lost. They are lost because of sin, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And if we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar. And that's 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 10. Uh, they may be lost, the world may be lost because of neglect. For in Hebrews 2, 3, the writer said, How shall we escape? that is, escape condemnation eternally. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? You don't have to curse God, as Job's wife asked him to do to relieve his difficulties. You don't have to curse God and die uh, in order to be lost. You can be good and honest and sincere and conscientious and devout and religious and practicing some religion with all sincerity and still be lost because of a neglect to look into and search out and find 
the truth that can make you free, John 8, 32. And uh, many people today may be lost because many Christians don't care about the lost. Oh, of course they would not admit a lack of care for the lost, but by practice we may sometimes demonstrate that we don't really care about the lost, and also that we don't really believe all those people out there are lost. So as we think further along this line, I wanted to suggest that millions today, perhaps billions today, are terribly lost. Now you may say there's no difference between barely lost and terribly lost. Well, what I mean by this is those heathen who do not know the Bible at all, do not know the Word at all, and such are terribly lost in the sense that they are without God and without hope in the world. They are not only lost in this present day, but they are lost forever unless somebody helps them. Romans 10, 14 suggests this that I quoted a while ago, and likewise, John 8, 24, that you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Truth doesn't make people free in and of itself. One time, many, many years ago, I lived in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I got a little piece of cinder in my eye, and it was very painful, and it irritated the actual eye. I went to the doctor, he got it out, but I still had the irritation. He, put, he gave me some penicillin to put in it, which was a new thing to me and to most people. It was when penicillin first came out. And so I used the penicillin and it healed my eye very readily. Now, 10 years before that, I would have had grave trouble perhaps because there was no penicillin, except that in reality, Penicillin has always been here, could have been here all the time. But the trouble is we didn't know about penicillin. And so it is with so many of the advances that we have in medical science today that uh, delivers us. Take, for instance, in, I guess it was the mid-50s, somewhere there, uh, we had that terrible outbreak of polio. And then... Uh, the, uh, the vaccination was discovered, and we've almost been made free from polio. You know that is true. You seldom hear of a case of polio anymore, in spite of the fact that 35 years ago people were dying like flies from it. Well, what's the difference? The material, the substance that makes us free from polio was here when Adam lived and was here when Jesus lived. But it didn't make people free from polio until it was discovered, until we know about it. And so Jesus said, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. That brings us closer again to the point I'm making up to now. There are other millions in the world, and they're all around us, who are almost saved, or we could put it the other way, are barely lost. Oh yes, they're lost, but barely lost, because they have the Bible, and they think they're obeying the Bible, and they're living good lives, and they do believe in Jesus Christ, but... For instance, they may have received a wrong baptism. Haven't you ever preached a sermon or heard another preach a sermon and when some uh, good denominational person leaves the building, they say, I enjoyed your sermon. And in some instances, I didn't want them to enjoy it because I wanted them to be pricked in their hearts by the gospel message. 
What I'm leading up to is you can preach to a lot of good denominational people about baptism for the remission of sins. You can preach to them day after day after day and they'll be totally satisfied because they think that sprinkling which was uh, rendered upon them when they were babies constitutes baptism. And they'll tell you, well, I was baptized when I was a baby. And so they're still just as lost as if they had not heard the word at all, as, though, as if they never saw the Bible and didn't know there was a Bible. They're just as lost as that. Uh, and so uh, many people who have been immersed, they will tell you, well, I was immersed. Uh, I was saved uh, back in October, and I was immersed on Easter. And they believed they were saved first and then immersed in water. And they're just as lost as if they would have stayed dry all the time because that is not scriptural baptism and will not bring them into salvation in Christ. I'm saying these things to emphasize our responsibility in that regard. What an awesome responsibility it is for those who know the truth and are saddled with the responsibility of bringing that truth to the world. <clears throat> Arrangements and circumstances surrounding various evangelistic efforts are often beset with problems, and we want to consider some of those for a few moments. In the first place, there is the problem of among my brethren I'm talking now, there is the problem of centralization or sponsoring churches. It has been mentioned, this matter has been mentioned by me and by Brother Owen and maybe even by Brother Houchin, but it's been mentioned from this pulpit during this series several times. But we want to keep it in our mind that the sponsoring church arrangement may bring souls to Christ, but it may not produce uh, the scriptural church for which Christ died. It is an unscriptural organizational structure. And I have I've said ever since uh, Herald of Truth, for instance, was born, and by the way, the originators of that program were very close friends of mine, especially James D. W D. Williford, a very close friend of mine. And uh, ever since that program started, uh, it has been a thorn in the flesh in reality, in that it centralized a part of the work of maybe 2,000 churches as it all came under one eldership, and first of all in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and Madison, Wisconsin, and then transferred to Abilene, Texas. <coughs> and I started to say that I have rejoiced in every soul that has been won to Christ by the Herald of Truth program, but I have to object to the organizational structure. And I found numerous people who were converted by the preaching they heard on that program, and then who came to realize the danger that it poses for the future of the church and even for the quality of the church right now. Of course, if you've seen that program recently, you know that it's degenerated into nothing but a social program and that it's almost completely void of any scripturalness whatsoever. Then there's the missionary society which uh, existed a long time ago and to some extent I guess even today. It was uh, implemented out of sincerity but nevertheless an unscriptural structure in that it provided a system by which many churches could send part of their money to the missionary society, which society would choose the field, choose the worker, oversee the worker, 
send him, bring him back, all of that without consulting the churches. And the churches thus, in giving their money to the society, gave up that much of their work, which means that if they could give up that much of their work to the society, they could then scripturally, if they wanted to, give up all of their work and let the society run their work. And that's the, that's the universal church in action. Remote oversight sometime exists, and this is what I mean by remote oversight. Every once in a while, I run into somebody yet in what is called conservative churches, and somebody says, we are overseeing a man in Germany or Norway or Nigeria or the Philippines or India. The church, he means, where he worships is overseeing that work. And maybe he uses sometimes the word sponsoring, and that would not have to be bad if it is understood. But it is bad if it means that they are trying to oversee that man in the field. Now, maybe I've already mentioned this here. If I have, I've forgotten it, but I often do. And that is that we need to remember that the preacher in the field is not a member of a church in America. That is, if he's overseas, he's not a member of the church in America that's supporting him. It's impossible to be a member of a congregation where you do not worship and participate. And so uh, for elders to oversee somebody that is 7,000 or 12,000 miles away is certainly an unscriptural situation. We don't read of Paul being under the oversight of any congregation, but he did have an obligation to the people who sent him out, and we'll deal with that in a moment. With regard to uh, uh, the work of evangelism as it is done by the local church through the use of its treasury in supporting preachers, uh, preachers here and there and everywhere. I want to deal with that a little because I haven't dealt extensively with it. In the first place, uh, there needs to be a better communication in most instances between the church and the preacher in the field. Too many preachers in the field, whether that's in Podunk City, City Iowa, or Bug Tussle, Tennessee, Yes, there are those places. If it's in those places, or if it's 12,000 miles away, uh, the too many instances the preacher in the field has little responsibility, it seems, or exercises very little responsibility in reporting to the church that's supporting him. I know because we're helping support 16 men where I... I'm a member in Aurora, Illinois, and I know that some of them report faithfully and diligently, and some of them hardly report at all. Now, if I were an elder, I would send them, if, and they haven't reported for maybe six months, I'd send them a check and say, this is the last check you'll get until we hear from you. And... I would mean it too because there's no excuse for this. They will tell you we're too busy. Well, yes, they're too busy doing things that they could uh, I could uh, give up for a part of the time. It's not that they're too busy preaching the gospel. They may be too busy working on their computers or something of that nature or playing golf or a number of other things, but I know I've been in the fields where we taught all day and preached uh, a third of the night, and still we were able to, re to report to those who were supporting us. In the second place, the preachers who do report, and if there are any here who are going to go into those fields, even if the field is only a short distance away, I want to suggest something that's only an expedient, and that is report, and report regularly. Let the brethren know uh, that you're going to be reporting every month or every two months or something, 
and then report briefly. We get reports that are on our bulletin board all the time that sometimes contain three pages, and who's going to stand by the bulletin board? How many will stand by the bulletin board and read those long essays about uh, naming every uh, person by name that they've studied with for how many times they've studied and all this. You can report all that needs to be said to keep the brethren informed on one page, one page of typewriter paper. <clears throat> with regard to communication, uh, some churches say, say we ought to support men nearby so that we can uh, go and see the work and the worker. Well, that would be wonderful if nearby was all the world. But Jesus didn't say, go into the nearby places and preach the gospel. And he didn't say, the church is the pillar and support of the truth in the nearby community. So uh, we need to broaden our scope in that regard. Uh, there is a possibility of some effectiveness if we would bring the man in the field to us to report, to be with us, bringing, bring him to us to preach in a meeting or something of that nature. But this is impractical if we're talking about native preachers in such places as the Philippines and Nigeria and India and such as that. It's impractical for several reasons that I don't have time to discuss now. And then the brethren at home have a responsibility, I believe, to read the reports insofar as they can. I'm sure your bullet bulletin board contains so many that most of you have never glanced at even. But it's good exercise to come early a few times and stand there at the bulletin board and read. The greatest problem with regard to evangelism pertains to money. First of all, maybe I should say to men, but I've already discussed that some in other lessons. But when a man decides to go into the fields of the world, his problem is money, and we need to realize that the gravest problem may be money after all because many more preachers would go if they didn't have to beg. And some of them have told me and I, when I've asked them, why don't you go to Nigeria? Why don't you go to the Philippines? And they say, I refuse to beg. Now, it's a pity that they have to beg, beg. And I've said, I wish I could see the day when churches were sending out elders or somebody else uh, out into the various places hunting for a preacher that will go, and then they will send him. That's the way I went to the Philippines and Australia. I had no idea I would ever go there. But the 77th Street Church wrote to me. I didn't write to them. And that would be a blessing to the cause of Christ if we should become so enthused about gospel work in other fields that we would uh, see the importance of providing the money. And if we don't have it in the treasury, tell the brethren and they'll provide the money. And there will hardly be an exception to that if you have any considerable number of people at all. They'll dig down a little deeper and provide the money to enable you to support somebody or provide partial support. And sometimes that partial support will keep the actual wolf away from the door for that preacher's family in some of those fields. <coughs> in, in, for, yes, in 1 Corinthians 9, 11 to 14, we read finally that uh, the laborer is worthy of his hire. And in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18, uh, P uh, Paul wrote of muzzling the ox. You don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. Now that was not our corn, which was Indian maize. That was wheat or barley or rye or rice or those kind of grains that they called corn. And the way they threshed it was to put it on the floor and take an ox and have him keep him walking over that floor until the grain was all threshed out and then they winnowed that by throwing the straw up in the air and the wind would blow it away and they had their grain left. 
Well, he suggests when you do that, you don't muzzle that ox. You allow him to have enough to eat too. And so the preacher in the field certainly deserves adequate support. The number one problem usually is getting the new church in the field, the new church that is established, or in the case of some of these most fruitful fields, it may be many churches that the preacher is working with to get them to support the preacher. I've been trying to do this for more than 30 years, and it's an almost impossible task to get them to realize their need and their responsibility. And we insist that the native preachers determine to press those churches into supporting them, supporting the preacher. But it is still a very difficult problem. I admit no way of, I admit that I know no way of solving that problem instantly or even in a reasonable time. And then the question arises, how long shall we support a man in the field? Well, as long as he is faithful to the word and as long as he is doing the work of an evangelist. Paul said to Timothy, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine for the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and will turn away their ears from the truth and will be turned unto fables, but watch thou in all things. Do the work of an evangelist. And if he's doing the work of an evangelist and if we're fully persuaded that he's faithful in life in, uh, uh, and in, preaching, in the preaching and teaching that he does, then continue to support him. And so there are different circumstances and we must not judge every field by some fields. You can go into northern, the north half of Alabama and start a new church, a new congregation, and in a couple years it'll be self-supporting easily. Usually that's done. You can go into Minnesota and Wisconsin and the Dakotas and start a new congregation, and maybe 20 years later it's still far from what we would call a self-supporting church. And I can give you the good reasons why that is true. It is not because those people up there are or meaner people or worse people than the others, but it's because of circumstances that has happened to the two countries, uh, because of what uh, the background of the people, in other words. And so uh, I just use that to illustrate the need of staying with the man in the field, whether it's in Canada or in Wisconsin or Minnesota, or if it's in some place uh, where the harvest is truly plenteous. Different background of the citizens of those places where the work may be done may have a very large effect upon, upon the work being done. When I first moved to Wisconsin, people would come, well, especially when I lived in Milwaukee, where so many people came. They'd come and visit our services, and they would say, why is the church so small? Why is, are there only six or seven churches in Wisconsin? We can't find one. I had a ready answer. I said, because you and I didn't come up here and teach these people. And I didn't have any more quarrels over that. Well, that'll have to be enough for now. My time is virtually up, and we do, do not want to impose upon the others at all. I've appreciated the privilege to talk to you about evangelism. There are a whole lot of more things that should be said and could be said and perhaps you would think of. And I would be delighted if we could have had a situation where we had a question and answer period. I love those. And you especially might want to ask me how much money should you send to the men in the field. And that's something you can't put a figure to Instantly, it'll all be dependent upon circumstances. But uh, we don't have opportunity for that here. And I thank you for your patience in listening to me and to my crackling voice uh, throughout this series so far. Thank you much. <laughs>